So Greek reemergence, how did Hellenic peoples, Hellenic people, those are Greeks. That's what they called themselves. They did not call themselves Greeks. So what do we know about the Bronze Age that we've been talking about when it comes to the Greeks? What do we know about them? Who were they? What they do? Yes, the Mycenaeans. Uh, they were your heroes from what epics? Homer? Yeah, what, what two books of Homer? Iliad and Odyssey. Can someone tell me what the Dark Age was? Yeah, a lot of sea raiders, just general instability, uh, really a Dark Age. It's the collapse of the Bronze Age and the early Iron Age that is your Dark Age. And so some major shifts are happening. A lot of people say that this Dark Age is just the early Iron Age, but is there overlap? Absolutely, there is there's, there's overlap. And when we say re-emerge, we mean form larger communities, come together with trade, a growth in population, you know. So if, you're, if your population is really thin, it's not going to do you very much good to form an urban environment when there aren't enough bodies to farm and trade and administer and et cetera. Let's take a look at the map. Greek re-emergence coming out of the ancient dark age. Map orientation. What, what is the name of this country here, this modern nation? What do we call it? Turkey. Turkey. Uh, Hittites were up here, yeah, very good, in the Bronze <laughs> Age. And they're gone now. Uh, once we, the Greeks are re-emerging, the Hittites are long gone. Um, and the Neo-Assyrians and Babylonians, they still are still around. But all this area in orange are your, they're your Greek settlements. Now, when we look at the actual Bronze Age, the area that has already collapsed, one of your main capitals was right over here, Mycenae. That's why we call them the Mycenaeans. And so this is actually an old fortress in rubble. And your main cities that exist now in, this, um, in Greek reemergence is Sparta. We know about the Spartans, right? Fierce warriors. They enslaved their neighbors to allow them to become full-time soldiers. Athens, our most important city that we'll be speaking about, they were really the first to create radical democracy. Um, their strength was in their navy, whereas Spartans, their strength was on the ground with their infantry. Uh, Delphi, Oracle at Delphi, that's a very well-known place in Greece where people come from all over to what we'd say have our fortunes told, but to, to speak to the oracle to get a obscure response or a yes or no answer. Okay, so this is the Peloponnese, this weird looking thing down here at the bottom where Sparta is in Corinth. And Attica is that area that surrounds Athens. And you have uh, Thessaly up here. And you have the Macedonians way up north. What do you know about the, anybody know anything about the Macedonians? Alexander the Great was a Macedonian. The Greeks kind of thought they weren't very Greek. They weren't Greek enough. Um, but they spoke a dialect of Greek. Uh, when we talk about the Iliad and the Odyssey, in the Iliad, you had a bunch of Greeks get together af, uh, uh, under a leader from Mycenae named Agamemnon. And they got on their ships and they went across the water and attacked a very large city in the Iliad. What is the name of that city in the Iliad? That's right up here, that's Troy. So when we read the Iliad, and we, we, we read about all these Greek heroes that got together, this is where they sailed, just right up here. You know, it's a good distance, you know, but I mean, it wasn't like they had to traipse all the way over to uh, Iraq, you know, to attack Babylon. So this is really at the collapse of the Bronze Age. That's one of our, you know, last epic tales, the Iliad. And the Odyssey talks about um, Odysseus trying to sail back home um, and all the adventures that he runs into. Uh, here is Crete, uh, the Minoans. In the Bronze Age, they still existed, but after the collapse, they were all wiped out. They no longer existed. They had beautiful palaces and frescoes and, and a great culture that was just completely wiped out. Um, so it's kind of an orientation to the map there. Uh, so we already know what this Dark Age is, really, uh, in terms of time periods. Um, now keep in mind, this can be very confusing. When we say Iron Age, a lot of people automatically assume that we're using iron weapons already. We're still using bronze weapons at this point. Um, iron weapons don't come until a little later. Remember our, uh, our big question is about 
how did Hellenic peoples reemerge from the ancient Dark Age? And that's what we're going to try to phrase everything in, in, the, in that light. Anti-monarchical attitudes. So remember, in the Bronze Age, the Mycenaean Age, kings were everywhere, you know? But after the collapse, for some, some reason, most Greeks re completely reject the idea of the basileus or the king. How interesting. So something was happening in this dark age to put a bad taste in their mouth regarding sort of uh, the ruler who can call the shots, you know. People want something more like an oligarchy or a democracy, and some people will actually favor tyrants. What's an oligarchy? That's one of the, these are the three sort of common governments that you'll see in Greece, democracy more toward the end. But if we don't want kings, here are other alternatives. What's an oligarchy? But yeah, it's just a small group of people in power. Uh, oligarchy, usually a council of elders, usually aristocrats. Um, an oligarchy can be acceptable to uh, Hellenes, Greeks, um, because there isn't just one person at the top calling the shots. So if you have an oligarchy, you might actually have this council being formed by all your tribal heads. And that's kind of okay because your tribe is being represented by, you know, someone that stands for you or your tribe, right? So it's more of a collective of leaders of tribes, not necessarily just the aristocrats in power. Hey, but sometimes that's the case. Sometimes there's a, re a real corrupt oligarchy that's really closed off to only certain families. That certainly exists. In ancient times, a tyrant is someone who came to power illegally. Um, they might be an aristocrat and people might love them, which was often the case. Many times an ancient tyrant would come to power because they had the support of the people. They were wealthy, they gave them aid and money, um, or they somehow gained favor from them through other means. So when we talk about, say, the tyrant of Athens, Pisistratus, he was very, a very benevolent leader. I mean, he was a good leader. He wanted to stay in power, and of course we think of that as very corrupt, somebody who's holding on to power illegally. Um, but it wasn't until his sons came along and after he passed away that they abused power. And then, you know, certain heroes of democracy are the ones who slew the tyrants, the sons of Pisistratus. So a tyrant, yes, it's someone who takes power illegally, but it doesn't always mean that people hate them or that they're a tyrant. Because we use the word tyrant to say someone who's actively evil, <laughs> you know, actively damaging. But that's not necessarily the case here. If there is civil war in a polis or city-state, it could be the tyrant that saves thousands of lives because they bring stability, because they have an organized military to keep other armies from fighting in the city. So it's just another form of government. Democracy, on the other hand, which we, most of us know fairly well, it comes from two great Greek words, demos, which means people, and uh, kratos, which means power, so power of the people. Democracy comes along for various reasons we'll talk about more later on, but it has to do with changes that Athens made that allowed non-aristocrats to have more voting power. So those are your three main governments. And so just to wrap that part up, when I say anti-monarchical, I often think that the reason that they were so anti having a king or basileus was that during the Dark Age, when the population was so scarce, they didn't have a whole lot of protection, and each individual tribal unit was kind of on their own, I imagine a lot of people were exploited by leaders of other tribes and so-called kings of, of major cities, and the people were just tired of being unprotected and exploited. And so when the population grew at, during the Greek reemergence, uh, people began to trade more, there was more prosperity, so people already had recent memories and oral traditions telling about the corruptive nature of kings. And, and they defined themselves by rejecting <coughs> kings. That was part of their identity, is to reject. It was almost like an Eastern thing, a foreign thing to have a king. So one of the reasons that the Greeks thought the Macedonians were not very good Greeks is because the Macedonians kept kingship alive since the Greek reemergence, whereas everyone else in Greece, except Sparta, rejected the idea of kings. So we get the real roots of democracy real early on in the fact that they rejected the idea of kings. They weren't 
a democracy yet, but they're getting there. Sparta is unique in that they have two kings. They have a mixed government. So it's an oligarchy and it's a form of democracy, but it also has two kings. Okay, so when we talk about Greek reemergence, you want to think in terms of growth, population, and trade equals the polis. The polis is the city-state. So when I say Athens, that's one city. We also call it a city-state because it's basically the capital of Attica, which is the entire area around it, Attica. So now what's happening with the polis is it's basically a major, and you can say capital city, that's fine. <coughs> Ancient historians will say that that's not necessarily correct, but that's basically right. It's when one big city begins to control and protect one larger area. It organizes the plots of land, it says who's aristocratic, it says you know, who can do what, it defines the idea of a citizen, you know, and who's a foreigner, why? because you're developing more advanced uh, governmental you know, institutions, whether it's laws or uh, redistribution, redistribution of wealth or, or pulling in uh, young men to go to war. So the polis is because of all this growth and because of the growth of the aristocratic class in general, you're getting larger organizational units centered around a city. That's what a polis is. That's all, it's all a polis is. And you'll wanna know that. Greek reemergence. You have a big boom in trade. Uh, the Greeks are coming into contact with the Phoenicians. They're all over the Mediterranean, but their main capital is right over here. <clears throat> what we'd call sort of Syria, Israel, Judea. They were all up through there. They had territories in Northern Africa and Spain, Sicily, which is right off Italy, uh, Malta, that sort of thing. The Phoenicians were everywhere and they spoke a Semitic language. They were traders. They traded by sea, very similar to the Greeks, because the Greeks are very much coastal and island-based. And what the Phoenicians gave the Greeks is the phonetic alphabet. What is the phonetic alphabet? It's the alphabet we have. I don't know if they still teach the alphabet in school, but. So there's a sound for every, every letter has a sound. Very, yeah, very good, phonetic. And so it used to be, let's say that's a letter, all right? And this would mean something like k, all right? And so it's a consonant and a vowel combined. This is not phonetic, by the way. And let's say we have that, and it equals ha. And so to create a language in that way, I would have to need a syllabary that's like 60 or 200 characters long, okay? So if you are combining words, Hebrew, the Semitic languages, Indo-European languages in general, before the phonetic alphabet was invented, your, what we call the alphabet, would be way too long, difficult to memorize, and it would also make it very difficult for you to learn other languages. So with the phonetic alphabet, each letter is just a sound, right? And each letter is the actual sound, right? And so we have all our vowels and consonants, and it used to be with most languages, vowels never really got a letter. They never got a sound. It would be grouped with a consonant, like k, ka. They would have to be two different characters, you see? So we can now construct words out of single letters and other people who know that basic phonetic language can translate uh, and learn that other language. So let's look here. The first three letters of the Greek alphabet, alpha, beta, gamma. First three letters of the Hebrew alphabet, anyone know? Aleph, Beth, Gimel. And so what you'll notice is that this Greek alphabet is an Indo-European language, but it's based off the Semitic language. And we can tell this by comparing it to, in its base structure, to say Hebrew, or it's even more closely related to uh, the language that the Phoenicians would use. So we see in structure, the Greeks are basing their letters and their learning of their own language off Semitic phonetic Phoenician ideas but the words themselves are Greek and Indo-European. -Euro so in other words, they're using a Phoenician alphabet and Phoenician characters to basically recreate their own language using phonetic letters. Why? Because their original written language was forgotten. Matter of fact, we have records of their forgotten language, but we can't decipher it. Uh, eventually, I think we will. So we have the phonetic alphabet and its importance. Now let's talk about aristocracy. Remember the question is, how did the Hellenic peoples reemerge from the ancient Dark Age? The aristocracy kind of organized things. They're the ones who 
helped create trade initially, right? Because they already had some wealth, they already had contacts abroad. Aristocracy tend to network internationally throughout Greece. So if you're a member of the aristocracy, you would probably know someone in Corinth. You might even have family in Corinth or an old family friend, you know. So the aristocracy really helped lead the idea of Hellenic identity after the reemergence. Some of these we'll just go through quickly because we already know about them. We know about how the aristocracy appropriated ideas from the Iliad and Odyssey. They would fabricate a family tree to make them related to one of the heroes in the Iliad or Odyssey. They would look back at the Bronze Age at some of the tombs and architecture that was left behind and invent stories so they could simply show a continuousness between themselves and the past. They don't know if they were related to those people directly or not. They would just make things up. So if they found, my example was a Thalos tomb, a really large mound with a beautiful, huge, ornate tomb that goes into the ground. When they would discover one of those, they would invent its use. They would say, oh, this was the tomb of, you know, this specific hero of uh, Hyacinthos. And so we're going to create a shrine and we're going to put uh, a, a family to maintain the shrine who also happen to be aristocrats and it'll help build what we'd call a tourist economy. And so that's an example of using archaeology and architecture to create a sense of identity from your undiscovered past. Olympic gods and local temples. There's a th little term called syncretism. Syncretism is when you've got a bunch of different gods floating around, right? Most of our cultures at this time, they have multiple gods. And so when you travel 20 miles, 20 miles or more, you're going to come to a place that might have a different set of gods than you. Or they might emphasize different gods over the ones you emphasize and pray to. If you go further out, you're going to find places with gods that are similar to your own, but probably have different names and maybe different attributes, you know. Uh, you can go into one city, and Aphrodite is the love goddess. You go to another city, she's not only the goddess of love, she's also a goddess of war. Or maybe she just symbolizes childbirth in that city. Or maybe she only symbolizes prostitutes in that city. What we're doing with Greek reemergence is these aristocrats and priests and that sort of thing, they're syncretizing. What they're doing is they're making sure they're all on the same page. If you have a female god who's a, a warrior, you know, that's well, going to be Athena. You have an erotic goddess, it's going to be Aphrodite. If you've got a sort of maiden goddess who protects little girls and animals, who's that? That's Artemis. You know, if you have a sun god, that's Apollo. If you have a god who protects kings and sends lightning bolts down or hammers, that's going to be Zeus, all right? And it just goes on and on. And so they syncretize under these Olympic gods. And when you do that, you, your cities can communicate with each other. You can validate each other. You can say, oh, this is a temple. Um, like all the other temples to Artemis throughout Greece. So it increases networking and identity between each location, not just in your own city, but between each city. So we have evidence of not just the polis building, people constructing a culture in their one polis, you have a Hellenic wide construction of identity. And you can show that through syncretism of the Olympic gods. That has to do with local temples. Like I said, my illustration, you might have one local temple that's called a different thing than another, you syncretize those and you're going to get them on the same page. You're going to put them on the same uh, tour route. The festivals become similar. Certain temples be, you know, control festivals in the town. Uh, names start resembling each other. Throughout the Dark Age, you actually had a lot of temples and shrines um, that were led by female priestesses. You actually had a lot of shrines for female goddesses. If you really look at the Greeks in the Dark Age, you have an uncanny amount of goddess worship and female priestesses. We don't know about those very much anymore because they were syncretized under one or two female goddesses. So it looks to us <clears throat> from the archaic and classical age like the Greeks had a real male dominant religion. Eh, that was kind of artificial. That was something that was put on top of the Greek past to make it look more patriarchal, a little more Indo-European, you know, synchronize the Dorians and Ionians throughout the land after re-emergence. So a lot of historians now are saying, and a lot of books are being published about this, is that this, uh, the Olympic gods that we have now are not actually indicative of, of the deep Greek past. It was almost an artificial 
structure that was put on it just to put everybody on the same page and to be a little less feminine. You needed strong male masculine gods when you develop these more warlike polis, stronger organization, stronger trade. So uh, there's a lot of developments going on in that research. Olympic Games start with the Greeks, of course. And the area of Elis right over here is where they'd hold the Olympic Games every four years. And uh, many different Olympic events that we know, you know, like field sports, javelin, you know, that sort of thing. Lots of running, sprinting, uh, wrestling, boxing, many different uh, horse riding, horse racing, chariot racing. Um, even singing and poetry competitions would take place at the Olympic Games. And so, well, not only do we have the Olympic Games in Elis, but there are other more minor games throughout Greece. So essentially what would happen initially is aristocrats were the ones that were concerned with these sporting events. They would get together, they would meet relatives and old friends of the family who were also aristocrats. You know, maybe once a year, maybe just once every four years, they would reconnect, re-network, you know, tie together some new trade agreements, right? But also compete in the Olympic Games and sort of, you know what sports are like, they build camaraderie. But the Olympic Games, and your textbook talks about this for a couple pages, uh, helps build an identity for the Greeks. And really, when you look at some of these things, like the epic traditions, the Olympic gods, the Olympic Games, that today, that is the identity we put onto the Greeks. So I would say they were quite successful at it. So that's my little introduction to Greek reemergence. Now it's your turn.